Down stairwells layered into a concrete storm wall, they walked hand in hand together into the cosy coffin of the cavernous clutter crawl. Merchants, mobsters, militants and salesmen of all kinds intercepted excess surplus as freight shifted between rail cars from one rail gauge to another by muscle and mule. Tucked away under concrete sheets and seismic plates, Tamarinth's largest goods exchange took place between the Transportation Union's East-West Gridline 01 and North-South Gridline 12, as surplus goods that had fallen off the wagons fetched a fine price for Ilesh scavengers, moonlighting quartermasters and requisitions officers. Those who sold semi-legitimate goods did so opposite the station from refugees, bartering up what they carried with them as they fled the northern homesteads, before embarking further south to larger emergency centres along the Noraic coast. With requisitions redirected by the war, international fiat, Ordenstaat bonds, ration punch cards, big sea scrip and low-key barters had founded a commercial shanty town. Why are you taking me to the Belly Bazaar? Kate asked. What's here that's not in the Cherish? A special surprise for a special someone, Greg answered. A stout, shirtless clothier among racks of textiles squatted among the rail cars deposed from service in a container ripped open by the claws of some massive monstrosity. A sign hung over the rail car's grievous gash, written in six languages. Exotic fashion, royals only, no barters, no haggles, no refunds. Uncle O, Kate said, skedaddling into the mosaic's embrace. She'd found flourish in her hips while dancing the Noran's tap, not like Greg in his jealous jaunt. O hooted and hollered and hoisted Kate about, winding her like a ribbon. Uncle O! Kitty, you knucklehead! Back from the sea between and you still haven't found a better fool than this sad sack of shit. Good to see you too, pal, Gregor said, inspecting rainbow rolls and patterned cloth. The fancy colours of foreign fashions a bit extravagant for his liking. Can't stay long. We've occasion at the pier before the pianist packs up. Ha ha! O laughed, spinning and spinning, Kate clinging to his neck looking woozy with whimsy. O spun her off upon her feet and she went with a rook ballerina's soft step into a flourish curtsy, bumping a coat rack but sticking the landing. O and Greg gave a gentle clap. Kate galloped back to take a look at an opal brooch pinned to the discarded seren coat O carried but never wore. How opulent! This wouldn't be an Aotian jewel craft, would it, uncle? I'd never say so. A chequered pattern of gold and calcium lit O's grin. So how can I help a pair of poor parishioners who've lost their way? Greg mentioned a gift, Kate asked. Aye, O said, but it ain't half as pretty as that gem. The mosaic dove into a pile of mismatched seasonal selections in the latest pastel styles of the Rook and Triarchy, a varied assortment for kinder weather elsewhere. Seasonal fashion had no Velcan seamstress. Workers outside the Cherish Commune layered drab workwear, plain petticoats, or Millenstadt uniforms mixed together from modern equipment and surplus from the last war. O's bare back, rippled with swollen muscles and incomplete freedom inks, still padded and raw, over lashes scoured by miria and leather. Slave scars paved under freedom at long last. O emerged from the pile of clothes with a two-gallon hat, shimmering black and two heads tall. An entire icewood grouse, with icy blue and purple feathers, formed the panache for a lady to strut in a park or privy. Kate regarded the gawky taxidermy sewn unto the foremost fashion in another time and place. Golly, Greg, I'm gone for a half a stitch around the star, and this is what you get me? This is god-awful. But her blossoming joy and gentle laughter was god-given. Uncle, tell me there's a story here. Aye, poor lady lass, and her husband dipped shit in a wedding cake, passed through all in a tizzy, got caught in the early birdie's wave, and didn't have a crankshaft to light their engine, gave me a whole trunk full of greasy goods, pretty pricey, just so they could get enough for a private cabin away from the peasantry. Isn't it ugly? Greg tied the silk chin strap under Kate's veil as she drew hat over habit. Does that make me ugly? Kate gave another twirl. The linen robes of the choir, frayed under the layers of iron chimes woven into the neck ornament of a parishioner, a ray air, enforced the austerity and severity of faith upon her shape, but the loose-fit gown twirled like summer shores. I love it. How do I look? Like a bird, I'm afraid, 
Greg said, though he pit his laughter merry, it did not hide unease. Greg spent his days awaiting her return among the messenger pigeons in the Cherish aviary, wondering in what ways did they resemble the denizens of ghostly Ave. Soon, very soon, he'd know. You look the part, my dashing debutante. Gregor framed the hat over her fair face. For I cordially invite you to the first and only ghost gala upon the pier. On their return to the surface, through carved and switchback stairwells, she pinched his chin when alone in fresh air. Eras. Bless Kate's heart, and that look of hers she'd used to wear him down. Greg hoped the grouse a flight of fancy, but it whisked him off towards the horizon, where the beating wings of invasion upon the sunset called him hither. Don't you dare look like that, Kate said, but the hat loomed larger than she. We'll miss the music. But he couldn't be egged on. Greg lulled at the street side like the nobles in O's story. He hadn't a crankshaft to spark him up though he'd no trunk to trade away out either. Cathy understood, cozied close and cooed a canary's song. It's okay. I can just sing for you like I used to. We'll dance another time, in another place. We could ask her high furtherance for approval to travel. Somewhere warm where the sun shines aplenty. Be gone tomorrow. Like the isles, Greg asked. Dust flit his dry eyes. So soon the breeze blew. So soon. Anywhere at all. To Greyack, if we've no time for abroad. We could visit the Museum of the First Man and see the arts of Bray Masons. We could explore the tomb of Orden Lords in the shadow of the political bureau. Just as I told you all about when I was there enduring my perishing. Think of it. Us, together, under the three spires of a true blue cherish. I can think of no love greater than love shared in a harbinger's hall. They trotted the boardwalk alive with the walks of life. The pianist's pluck of Ahoy, Ahoy, off to Arvel, boy, sunk into its final act. Rising wind blew ripples across shimmering waters of Ordagan crater. The great basin of the fallen catastrophe Gassio, whose sunken bones spun up the gale winds that made Tamarinth so bleak, so formed the vessel of a great lake once fraught with life, now soiled with industrial sludge and runoff bile. As if by the sight of bubbling black waters, Kate's rising awe in the wondrous world afar went. Tears fell in its place, and her harmonious voice, resplendent enough to be honoured in the iron cherish, in the presence of the Orden Lord, broke. Please. The wind began to howl. The sand began to stir. The bloated clouds began to burst. Their hands caught each other's when the wind snagged her summer hat. The brim flapped like a sky ray as it snapped back, the bow snagged at her neck and pulled her veal tight into the milky mask of a ghostly geese. The wind drew a choir girl's gown supple. As she struggled, the cloud shadows mourned the distance growing between them. I have a confession, he said, untangling the hat from habit, peeling back her veil to look upon her bare. A Noran's tan gave glow to Kate's burnt sienna that no clouds could dim. Kate took his hand up to her precious skin. She caressed his knuckles, flayed from the hard labours of his childhood. Kate mended more pain than Gregor could conceive, but despite having brushed the depths of inhumanity, she maintained the regenerative caress of a wizened healer. To feel that care upon him, her breaths upon his neck, her fingers in his hair, was enough to drown him. So he breathed deep as he slid deeper and deeper, for there was no other way. I go tomorrow. Greg, Kate said, and in swallowing her pain, he knew what she willed as she held him there upon the water's edge. We could go. We can't. I must go, Greg told them both. I must, or else. God didn't make us as we are, so I can be happy to see you go off to war. She made me to love you, and without you I am lost. Tears and salt stained his bandages, scalding. Greg covered his eyes. What man destined for war could cry and expect a safe return? Yet there he stood, soft as cotton, and as easily picked apart. Swear you'll write to me, she asked. Swear you'll return and tell me all about it, of the beauty and pain. For I'll be here, mad neath the gale winds, yearning to be whole again. I'll write, Greg said, pushing weakness away. You swear you'll return. When you married me, you swore an oath stronger than our silence, stronger than duty or death. You swore that we'd ascend the steps of that cherish together and for a more perfect union. You swear. Upon Eris, 
I swear, he said, but feared himself an oath-breaker. They lingered, watching the phase frogs blink away as the lake boiled, fleeing to greener pastures in the city sewers. Greg needed the railing to hold him aloft, and if not for Kate, he'd have slid into the water. The star sunk into fetid clouds, rolling towards them with flecks of rain. The geothermal mills began to glug, and the machines went into motion, warming up to run hot in the approaching flash freeze. Say, Kate recalled, fishing through her shoulder bag, I brought you a gift too. A brown leather booklet embossed with a Noran aero lily found him. The pages are wax. Good for pressing, right? I filled the first few chapters with anything I found throughout the aisles. I didn't know the names, but figured you did. See? It's got one of those flowers with the flying petals. She brought him to face her as he struggled to keep a hold on himself and the book. An aero lily, Greg said. If they find a cloud, they'll plant their roots. I don't know what to say. Thank you. Kate winked and slid Sly up against him, tapping the book against his chest. Think there'll be any northern petals that'll find your flavour? Kate's gaze shined molten gold, seductively, beneath snow droplets of escaping hair and upon a smile like marigold. Greg looked away as she held strong for them both. Unless my memories of you, a phantasm upon the fields of sand, mean much to the botanists, I worry not. I worry. Kate beat the wind to tame the last locks of white hair beneath the habit's band. Stripped of corn poppies by the wind, bloody petals painted the boards. He'd shed her veil and now she shed his, and she kissed him, again and again, and for the last time. For then came the storm.